No, the secret to the fact that it's true, I, I don't age, Emily, I'm four decades younger um, biologically than I am chronologically. And people say, how? When, uh, yes, it is olive oil. Uh, uh, my mother 
uh, is Sicilian. In fact, she was born in Sicily. My mother's name was Maria Nunziata Serafina Graziella Fiorino Perpetuo Tadaro. <laughs> born in Syracuse, and at a young age, she came to America and married Jack Houston of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> And the secret is uh, Sicilian. We, we, many of us do not age. My mother was the same. And it's 4,000 years of olive oil running through your system. <laughs> Look at this. Well, you know, friends, I am so... Uh, something strange. I, you know something about yourselves? You are not boring God. <laughs> no, this is one of the most exciting, evocative, uh, rocket ship ignition churches in the United States. I mean, something is fascinating going on. You people are in the front lines of human transformation, whether you like it or not. Now, that, that doesn't mean it's easy. I mean, I'm so sure some of you born, you know, in the 20th century, you wonder how I get here, and I can tell you, you were raising your hand in the other realm when they were giving out the assignments for the 20th century, and you thought you were going to the bathroom, <laughs> and said you ended up there. Okay. Anyway, I am. I was so deeply, deeply, deeply moved by the music that everyone's playing, and then I also heard this guy, Rafe. Would you come up here, please? I mean, this is really interesting. First of all, I'd like to greet you in ancient Greek. By the way, this man has the ancient face. This is, you may think this is a Jewish nose, it isn't. It's older. It's the ancient Hittites, who when they went into Israel and they married with the Hittites, and it's the curvature. Um, I'm an archeologist by avocation, and I can assure you, I've seen the original bones, and they look just like you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to greet you in ancient Greek with Odysseus, because you are an Odysseus of music. And the words in ancient Greek are, Andra, moi enepe musa, polytropus. Sing in me muse, and through me tell the story of the man of many ways, much music, many turnings. So I'd like to, I'd like to challenge you. I'm going to sing to you in ancient Greek, okay? Whatever I'm going to sing to you is at least 2,000 years old. And you are going, I'm just going to sing the opening things, and you are going to sing back to me also in the music of ancient Greek, and we'll see where we go, okay? And, and you're going to forgive all my mis no, 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 there's no such thing. No, you're Odysseus, you know. You can <laughs> crash on shores and you keep on going, you know. Now download it, improvise. That, that was accurate. <laughs> and I'm one of the few people on earth that would recognize it. That was accurate. Where's this guy coming from? Where is he going? The fact that he is here at all says something about all of you. Something's going on here. I'm going to begin, in fact, with a 
a very great poem. I think it's the most important poem of the 20th century. It's by Christopher Fry, and it appears in one of his plays, A Sleep of Prisoners. And it, I'm going to first give you the poem, and then I'm going to uh, do an exposition de texte. I'm going to unfold it for where we are in this extraordinary time. The poem goes, the human heart can go to the lengths of God. Dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries breaks, cracks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flows, the thaw, the flood, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul folk ever took. Affairs are now soul-sized. The enterprise is exploration into God. What are you making for? It takes so many thousand years to wake. But will you wake? For pity's sake. First line. The human heart can go to the lengths of God. The human heart. It doesn't say the human elbow goes to the length of God or the human, you know, toe. The human heart. The human heart in the center of our being, resonant. Not just resident friends, but engaged with not just the fields, but the fields of earth, the fields of the universe, the fields of the mind and heart of God. We have direct correct connection. And because we have direct connection, we are not as bad off as we thought we were. And it begins with a stupendous fact that requires a stupendous act of belief changing. It's that you do not just live in the universe, the universe lives in you. I work at the forefront with some of the most innovative physicists, quantum physicists of our time. My, le my most recent book is about that called What is Consciousness? And it is the fact that we are the universe. We are not encapsulated bags of skin dragging around dreary little egos. We are organism environment symbiotic with the whole blooming universe. You say, but it's so big and I'm so small. No, you're actually right in the middle. Um, the smallest is 10 to the minus 23. The largest is something like 10 to the 43. We're 10 to the zero. You're right in the middle. We are giants. We are giants. And of course, there are in our universe, we know how many stars there are. There are over 300 sextillion stars. That's more stars than there are grains of sand on the Earth. And most of these stars have planets. And some of these planets have, who knows? Maybe variations of you and me. We have reason to believe that. In fact, I have a play that looks like it's going to Broadway, which is about that when three people who are actually the same person, but they don't know it, but show up from parallel worlds, and because of a cosmic seismic shift, they find themselves together, you know. So we, we have variations of ourselves, but we also are so fortunate to be living in the most critical time in human history. I mean, other times in history thought they were it. They're wrong. This is it. <laughs> this is it. Most of you live five to a hundred even 500 times the amount of sheer experience of your ancestor of 150 years ago. Now, of course, we're not prepared for this. So we get full of holes. Some of you are so full of holes, you're holy. You know, you, <laughs> but it means that we're available. We are shaken up, you see. So you see, once you really know that the universe is living in you, I mean the whole shebang, because we are cosmologically... Um, holographically, hologrammatically related. Once you know it and feel it and you understand it, it flows briny like sea in your blood. It is the biggest paradigm shift of all. Paradigm. Buddy, can you paradigm? I mean, paradigm shift. It changes everything. It reignites you. The point is that you, you really have to announce to the universe in very specific and active ways 
that you are really ready to change your belief structure because belief, belief patterns reality. Belief structures reality. So you announce your willingness to respond to this evolutionary principle that is beating upon your brain pan, announcing truly a potential new development in your development. It's an act of faith because it is requiring of you delving into the mysteries of the human condition that in some cases, most cases, have never been known before. Oh, the ancients know about it, but you know we're the ones who now have to make the difference. Now, the next lines are, dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. <laughs> Most interesting time in human history. Uh, we are in the midst of the greatest changes in human history. It is the changing of the game at every level. Climate, immigration, governance, ecology, theology, food, education, finance, industry, media, uh, IT technology, relationship between cultures, and the most important one of all, the rise of women to full partnership with men in the whole domain of human affairs. And as that happens, everything happens. Because with women, the emphasis is on process rather than product on making things cohere, develop, grow, inner space, known as is important at outer space, and the beauty of it by being fully who we are and in deep equality, this releases men to be who they truly are. And not, and not caught in the structures and the strictures of the ancient patriarchy. We don't need that anymore. So this, this is what is happening, my friends. And it's huge, it is huge, because all previous agreed upon rules, challenges, interactivity are up for grabs, and very few have been trained to it. My, my life is about training people at all levels, from presidents of countries to the man who pushes the broom in his leper colony in southern India. And I frankly make no difference between them. But what we find is this has to do with world World shift and changing the game, moving to world shift requires that we discover and enter into the many worlds, the many powers that we contain within ourselves, as well as the many, many, many new domains of human possibilities that are there within us. Gandhi, Gandhi said that as human beings, our greatness does not exist so much in remaking the world as it is in the remaking of ourselves. And it has to do with our understanding and accessing a whole new level of powers that can activate our capacity to make a higher self and a better world. There are so many, many latent powers that you contain within you. Just sheer embodiment, sheer embodiment, which is such a glorious thing. Sometimes it's literally a pain in the neck, but it is a glorious thing. If you really, really how many of you take care of your body? I mean, you do some exercise, yes? When I talk to Jesus, or to nuns, I say, will you just at least jump up and down for Jesus, you know, or do something? You know, there. <laughs> Why do you laugh? Nuns, you know, they have every experience. They work with the poor. They are highly educated. They have only one experience they don't have, you know. But, <laughs> they, you know. so the, the <laughs> I, I find them to be the most intelligent people in the world, by the way is uh, Catholic nuns. Do we have any present or past Catholic nuns here? Hmm? Yes, we do, yeah, all right. I always find that you can, well, let me try this again. Uh, was anybody at Woodstock? <laughs> Did anybody go to Woodstock? No? Did anybody go to Burning Man? Oh, there we go, all right, okay. I date from the Woodstock days, <laughs> you know. All right, so the other, the next line. Dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. And the, and by that we also mean, <laughs> I mean, this is, this is truly fascinating, that a whole new presence is rising in us. A whole new presencing. 
You are not just a human being having a spiritual experience. You are, as my old friend Teilhard de Chardin said, you are a spiritual being having a human experience. Oh God, here I am. <laughs> you are a universal being in a biodegradable space-time suit. You are a dramatic play of possibilities. You are the seeds of your mother and your father, but you're also the child of God having arisen from the universal womb of all becoming. The 13.8 billion year development process has resulted in your life, and it's based on Earth as well as cosmic evolution, and you, both born locally and universally, have been placed in a time of such complexity and challenge and opportunity and wonder that you are being refitted for both cosmic spiritual and local life. You are being refitted for both cosmic spiritual and local life. The page of history has turned big time. And the ideas and the discoveries of the millennia of wise ones and spiritual explorers, the creative gifts of artists across ages, and now the revelations of the nature of the cosmos uh, is setting you in a, in which your unique genius can live and experience a life that is unparalleled in human history, offering new powers, new cooperations, new knowledge, new opportunities into time. I talked about, you know, the fact that you are now realizing that inner space is as important as outer space. And when I have studied the 55 of the most, some of the most sustained creative people uh, in, the, in the world, among my research subjects, meaning they studied with me here, Margaret Mead, for six years, she lived with us the last six years of her life. I was her adopted daughter. I need another daughter, so it's probably you, she said. Anyway, <laughs> Margaret Mead, and uh, well, of course, Joe Campbell for 20 years. We did a lot of work together. And Buckminster Fuller, and Jonas Salk, and people whose names you would not know, but who were in that state of sustained creativity, and part of the secret is they were archaeologists of their own minds. They were spelunkers in the caves of their own creativity and they thought in images. Their image life, their imagination life was so powerful. Imagination is critical here. Um, yes, I did know Albert Einstein and Helen Keller, and when I went up and she talked when I was eight years old, and they asked, uh, does any child want to come forward and speak to Ms. Keller, because she had been so you know, numinous. And I went up, and she placed her whole hand on my face, and with the center of her hand she read my lips, and with her fingers she read my character, and I, I blurted out with a child's savage honesty, why are you so happy? And she laughed and laughed and laughed, and she said, and this is what she sounded like, my child, it is because I live each day as if it were my last and life in all its moments is so full of glory. And life in all its moments is so full of glory. Each moment is so precious. Each moment is so precious. One of the things we discover that time, you know, this kind of time is only one kind of time. We teach people how to take you know, 10 minutes or five minutes or even two minutes of clock time equals subjectively to all the time they need and out of that comes hours and sometimes months of work. Whole symphonies, novels, finishing your damn dissertation. I mean, this is... <laughs> So time itself, there's so many different things. Time, space, within ourselves, imagination. When we went, my fourth grade class, to meet Einstein, and he was very sweet, a little vague, a lot of hair, blue sock and a red sock on, you know. And one of our smart aleck kids said, Mr. Einstein, how can we get to be as smart as you? He said, eh, read fairy tales. We didn't like that answer at all. Mr. Einstein, how can we be smarter than you? Uh, read more fairy tales, by which he meant imagination. He said the biggest quality of his life, the deepest quality was he was an imagineer. He was imaginative. He was imagining all the times. He even imagined riding the light beams. Remember that? He was something else again. 
But imagination, what he was saying, leads us to the imaginal. Those are the creative, potent structures that lie there in the depths of consciousness itself. And through imagination, if you keep it going, you can actually contact it. You can tune in. And suddenly, you are getting downloads from the universe itself. Look at somebody like Hildegard of Bingen. How many of you know who she was? Born in 1098. She goes through the scotoma in her migraine. She doesn't say, boy, what a headache. No, she goes through it and then imagines herself into another realm and comes back with a music that's 200 years ahead of her time. And the botany and the biology. All of life, all of creation is available. But it takes a little change of focus, friends. Change of focus. Change focus, you change reality. Change belief, you change reality, and you open up to layers and layers. You discover that you are not this encapsulated bag of skin and stuck in local ego. In point of fact, you are many people. You have many, 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 many persona. I talk about myself. I hate to write. I hate to hate to write. But I have 35 published books and 250,000 pages of unpublished. How can I do it? Well, I'm a cook. So I pretend I'm not writing, I pretend I'm cooking things up. And I add ideas here, and things, really. So I go to another persona to be able to do things, you see. I mean, there's so much that we know. Myth, you are mything links. You're all, you all carry so many of the great, great, great stories within you. You know, we, we certainly found <laughs> this out in a big way. So the thunderer is the thunder of the flows, the thaw, the flood, the upstart spring. And that, of course, is what I have seen in the 109 countries in which I have worked since, well, mid-60s, I guess. Um, that there is a rising of presence. You know, maybe it is this foolish time of so much breakdown and everybody yelling, and, you know, we're better than that but it has shattered the old ways, hasn't it? And from that shattering is the open moment. We are in the open moment when we are available to the spring tide of new culture, new civilization, and a world that works for everybody, by gar, you know. <laughs> Children, think you just think anything, education. I've never met a stupid child. I've met incredibly dumb systems of education. So what I've done around the world is help get rid of the bad missionary British education, which the Brits abandoned a long time ago and some others, and put art back as central to the curriculum. Because, friends, if a child is dancing and singing and enacting and creating information, they do not fail because it's speaking to the whole body of the whole mind of the whole being, the sacred being of the holy child, you see. So that's something else. Now, um, the whole point is that we are in the springtime. We are in the springtime of our lives, you know. And this gives us something remarkable, you know. Now, I like to take this even further and say, thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul we ever took. And affairs are now soul-sized. We are in evolutionary jump time. I wrote a book once called that, Jump Time. You know, you look at the fossil record of any kind of species, and you say, look, same old, same old, 100 years, and the same old, same old, boom, and then suddenly it jumps. It's called punctuated equilibrium. We're in a state of punctuated <laughs> equilibrium. When people say, well, what's wrong with you? I'm in a state of punctuated equilibrium, that's why. <laughs> and they will applaud you, you know. But as Joanna Macy said, People are sick and tired of being pitted against each other when there's already so much suffering and the earth herself is under assault. They're ready to reconnect and honor the life we share. This is the great adventure of our time. And frankly, because I happen to have the blessed advantage or disadvantage of having traveled so much, uh, especially uh, you know, as a senior consultant to the UN and human development and related agencies, what I find 
his people are connecting. They are crossing the great divide of otherness. You wouldn't know it from the papers or from the papers online, except in the back pages maybe. But I find, you know, unfortunately with so much media, if it bleeds, it leads. I know, I was once the subject of being on the front page of every magazine and newspaper of the world for something that never happened. People saying I was Hillary Clinton's guru and I ran a seance. I didn't run a seance. I've never been to a seance. I just said, hey, Hillary, come on, you got to, because I was helping her write a book called It Takes a Village to Raise a Child. I said, Hillary, please, you're not talking to me. Who would you have loved to talk to? She said, Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> well, I had known Mrs. Roosevelt very well. Mrs. Roosevelt's the one who said to me, my dear, I rather suspect you're going to have a most interesting career. But remember, my dear, as a woman, you can expect to be trashed. You didn't say trashed, but it was something like that. But remember, too, my dear, a woman is just like a tea bag. You put her in hot water, and she just gets stronger, which is true to be true. <laughs> So the new millennium, friends, the new millennium, which we entered 17 years ago, is the crossroads between worlds, between species, between ourselves and forever. Ourselves and forever. You are its pilgrims and its parents, and no old formula or stopgap solutions will suit. For a new world to be born, we have to bring a new mind to bear, as Einstein also said. Nothing else will suit. And that's why we have entered into this time on Earth to ask the great questions, how can we make a better world? What must we do to serve the larger story? What do we have to do to make a difference? And the difference is happening, and it is the new springtime of spirit that is happening in our midst. I mean, I, I just look at some of my friends as I see this need and urgency of our time. The signs of growth are everywhere if you look for them. In contrast to the wastelands of government, grassroots movements are sprouting, connecting fields of ideas, greening the social agenda. Uh, millions of the old, what we used to call cultural creatives, but I could say the whole population of Seattle, you know, are adopting, are, are putting economics back where it belongs economics as a satellite to the soul of culture instead of being the center of the soul of culture, restoring the social balance. Here, you have this radical appreciation of nature, rewriting our covenant with the earth, celebrating our, our relationship, acknowledging that we humans here are her steward and partner and not her master, Aging baby boomers, I'm even earlier than that, but they're acknowledging that our elderly are critical to the health of the planet because having the breath of life, they have access to the depth, they have genuine love and a passion for the possible. They should be the evocators of our time. I myself am one for sending senescence into obsolescence, you know. And they've lived long enough to develop the necessary depth and simplicity. So I find that people are responding to the stress of current issues going beyond themselves. How many of you find yourself going beyond yourself? Really, going, no, real question, don't, don't do this thing with me, come on, real question. I mean, going beyond yourself. Some of you are learning skills you never thought to have. How many of you are finding yourself doing that? Um, I think some of you are are being inspired to take on heroically creative tasks that you never thought to do. Uh, my friend Joan in Massachusetts, a respected neurobiologist, is leading a revolution in science to bring together brain research and spirituality. My friend Francis, a male nurse and former monk, redeems intractable patients in a California schizophrenic ward with the sweetness of his nature and the depth of his compassion. Teresa, my friend in New York, she's an oncologist and a mystic and uses her spiritual presence and healing gifts to alleviate the dread and fear of cancer patients. Vandana Shiva, a physicist and ecologist in Delhi, writes and acts to combat corporate piracy of the world's <laughs> botanical heritage. She is the uh, enemy number one of Monsanto. <laughs> <laughs> 
Catherine, a Connecticut documentary filmmaker, creates programs for public television that illumine the human spirit. Helmut, a stockbroker in Berlin, organizes relief efforts to bring new hope to the children of war. And then, then there are the innovative institutions of grace, like the Center for Spiritual Living, that primes you and, more importantly, reminds you of who and what you really are that you are here because you are citizens of the change. You are models of spirit in action. You are models of spirit in action. And so the longest stride of soul we ever took, we are taking it. We are taking it. Affairs are now soul size. The enterprise is exploration into God. There is a whole new order of spirituality that is arising prompted not only by the harvesting of ancient wisdoms from all over the world, but also by the revolution in quantum physics that shows that we are the living universe and we have access to spirit, to invention, to creativity, and that our vast glory of our body-mind system is available to be transformed and to become numinous. It's true, I never used to announce my age. I do it now, to be an exemplum horriblum. So what I do, people say, how come you are biologically 43 and you are chronologically 80? It's because I do this stuff, that's why. You know, I do this stuff. And I tune in and I read frequency. I mean, Sicilian olive oil helps too, that's true, but in DNA. But, but I do refrequence because I figured, well, I might as well do something that is unusual. I don't do stuff. I don't put stuff on the face. Yeah, you know that thing. And if you want to say it's food and exercise? <laughs> Not exactly. When you travel as much as I do, you eat what they put in front of you, and often your exercise is carrying very heavy bags running through airports, you know. But... <laughs> No, I do a little of the other stuff too, but the point is, as you think, as you really believe, as you attune yourself to the vibrations of cosmic becoming, as you know, as Plato said, that you have an optimal template in the universe of yourself, uniquely you, that when you tune into it, it refreshes, it reignites, it even youthens, and that's my explanation, really. It's not anything fancy from fine and interesting magazines. Now, so you are here, friends. You are here in this exploration into God because you are God's stuff incarnate in a biodegradable space-time suit. And then the poem ends, what are you making for? It takes so many thousand years to wake. I mean... You have all these ancestors, all of you are looking at ancestor.com and all that. I, I did that once. It was very surprising. I was mostly ancient Greek and ancient Egyptian. I don't know where that came from. I don't know where, I'm the great, 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 great granddaughter of Sam Houston. You think some of that would have gotten in, but they didn't find it. I think those were the Mormons. I better go to somebody else. Anyway, <laughs> and that says, will you wake for pity's sake? Will you wake for pity's sake? And of course, dear friends, you really have to. You see, what have I been telling you about the extraordinary powers that you have that are emerging? And the greatest friend is, is that you are living in partnership with the universe itself, that you are the universe, the universe is in you, and then you wake up. I really want so much for you to, to feel at home in your own remarkable body and mind. And areas in your life where you felt stuck, whether it's trying to start a new business or focus more time on your art or find the right partner, it will simply begin to open up and flow because the power of the cosmos, the power of God will be generating the new reality with you. I want you to discover that truly you are and can be even more so a revelation to others. <laughs> an intellectual and psychological beacon. 
an evocateur of new patterns, new relationships, new discoveries. You can be one who brings new mind and new matter to an old world and serves as a catalyst of change, a pathfinder of deeper realities. And yes, in these cases, your people will feel drawn to you, sure, because you feel good. <laughs> You'll feel your positive, creative, constructive energy, your quantum energies of love and service, and they'll want to be connected to this and themselves become so much more than they had ever dreamed. You were born in the right time where the radical necessity is for you to become who you really, really are. And it's not just about you, it's about your friends, your family, the field of life around yourself as an agent of enhancement of world and time as an agent of enhancement of world and time. So those who really do this, and I hope many of you will do so, live in a state of flow, of quantum connection, having access to that power, that intelligence, that depth of love and creativity, a state that is you in your magnificence, that is living in a different, better, more exciting and inspiring world, now please hear this, you are needed. Don't give up, don't say, well that was an interesting sermon. <laughs> yeah. You are needed in this remarkable, awesome, challenging time. And yes, the human heart can go to the lengths of God. And I think of the poem, a wonderful, wonderful poem, Song of the Man Who Comes Through. Not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me. A fine wind is blowing the new direction of time. If only I let it bear me, carry me. If only it carry me. If only I'm sensitive, subtle, oh, delicate, a winged gift. If only most lovely of all, I yield myself and am borrowed by the fine, fine wind that takes its course through the chaos of the world like a fine and exquisite chisel, a wedge blade inserted. If only I am keen and hard like the sheer tip of a wedge, driven by invisible blows, the rock will split. We shall come at the wonder, we shall find the Hesperides. Oh, for the wonder that bubbles into my soul. I would be a good fountain, a good wellhead, would blur no whisper, spoil no expression, no. What is the knocking? What is the knocking in the door in the night? It is somebody wants to do us harm. No, no, it is the three strange angels. Admit them, admit them. D.H. Lawrence, thank you. <laughs>